you mentioned today that it's different between males and females. You've been studying, I guess, females mostly. We see a bigger effect in females than in males, both of dietary restriction and of reduced activity of this nutrient sensing network. And the same is true in mice. And we don't know why that is at the moment. I mean, one possibility is that females generally tend to be more anabolic than males. They make stuff to reproduce. Whereas males mainly go tearing around fighting other males and trying to get access to females. And the anabolic aspect of reproduction is not nearly so important for them. When you talk about um, a dietary restriction, there's, there are different opinions on the role of dietary composition versus uh, caloric restriction. Yeah. So what is your view on that? Well, my view is that we should call it dietary restriction, not calorie restriction. And the reason is that it's, it's very clear, at least in flies and mice. Again, in those two organisms, it looks as though protein's playing a key role. If you have a diet that, from the mouse's point of view, is deficient in protein, just overall nitrogen content, then what it will do, it's, it's got a, a target for how much protein it wants to eat. And it will eat enough of the diet to get that protein target, which means, of course, that it overeats the other ingredients because they're present in excess. So it gets fat, it gets metabolic disease and so on. So having too little protein in the diet is dangerous. But by the same token, so is too much protein. That seems to induce all kinds of other problems, particularly with the kidneys, um, but other things too. So it's not just calories. No. So people talk about being able uh, to take a single daily pill that would encourage healthy aging. And you've discussed this a little bit yourself. So how far are we from that? Perhaps not quite as far as, as one might think, um, because quite a few drugs that are already licensed for human use and that target bits of this nutrient sensing network are actually turning out to have a much broader therapeutic range than people had thought. So perhaps one of the most surprising is um, aspirin. Long-term users of aspirin, because a lot of people take aspirin at low doses to prevent cardiovascular disease, um, turn out to be resistant to various forms of cancer. So just extending the therapeutic range of existing drugs and ones that don't have too bad side effects, I think, will be one way forward. And so what is the most promising project you're working on in your lab, on your labs at the moment? Um, I think trying to find out just what type of aging related damage is being stopped or slowed down by these interventions that increase lifespan I regard as both the greatest challenge and the most interesting one because it's going to tell us at least partly what the underlying aging process is. Is it accumulation of damage at all? It's not really clear at the moment. I mean it could be overactivity of genes. Uh, I think we really don't understand that at the moment and I would really like to know the answer. So Linda, thanks a lot for taking time to talk to us and enjoy the rest of the end. I'm sure I shall. Thank you very much. <laughs>